Thank you, choir. Thank you, Kevin, for saving Mother's Day, because my sermon's not about Mother's Day. <laughs> it's a beautiful choir anthem, though, that we are talking about the end times. However, when, Je- <laughs> okay, just, when Jesus goes into this discussion about the end times, you remember what he does? He looks over Jerusalem, and, and his spirit is grieved. He says, how often I, I, I long to gather you to myself as, as a mother hen gathers her chicks to herself. And so that image of, of, of Jesus longing to gather us, just as our mom has gathered us here. Maybe you're here this morning because your mom, you know, kind of pressured you. Or you know, it's Mother's Day, so you got to come to church, okay? And she's gathering us, right? That's how God longs to gather us to himself. Draw near to him. And as we draw near to him, we draw near to one another in love and comfort and in his protection, in his refuge. <clears throat> So I titled this morning's sermon, Look Up, Look Up, because that's exactly what many people were doing this weekend after this, the Aurora Borealis showing up here, where people in Fresno could see it pretty incredibly. Um, you know, the sun, you know, shot off some charged particles at us and, you know, messed with the magnetic, magnetic fields and, you know, could have disrupted some satellites and power grid if it was bad enough. But, you know, really pretty, really cool. My wife went to go see it with... with you know, my mother in love, you know, as Alistair says, and father in love. And uh, they didn't see it though. So <laughs> they didn't see anything last night. But the night before, people really saw some cool things. Um, but it's appropriate. I saw a news article that says, look up, you know, the, the northern lights are in the skies. I'm like, yeah, yeah, look up. Um, our redemption draws nigh. And that is um, actually, you know, as we've been studying, you know, these. For, the Olivet Discourse is what it's called, where Jesus talks about his disciples asking, what are the signs of this, the, the destruction of the temple? Um, and they ask, what, what's the signs of your coming again um, and the end of this world? Um, and we've been in this discussion, Matthew chapter 24, as we've been studying Matthew's gospel account for a couple weeks now. And so, you know, I'm reading the end times into everything now, obviously. <laughs> Probably you are too. Uh, you'll forgive me. But Luke, in Luke's parallel account, chapter 21, We read, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, um, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads. Look up, as some translations say, because your redemption is drawing near, is drawing nigh. He's at the gate. Um, and so that is our, that's our perspective uh, this morning, that we are always ready uh, for the imminent return of Christ. We're, we're looking, we're watching, we're waiting. And so as we finish up Matthew chapter 24 this morning, we are, we are told by our Lord to not become a people, you know, who, who kind of look to, to goof off because the master is long in his, in his return. Um, you know, people who seek to, you know, see how far we can go without crossing the line, you know, tiptoe to it, you know, and, and say, well, this is okay, right? We can, you know, maybe uh, try a little bit more and, and just get a little more lax in our faith and our walk with him and, you know, and, and just backslide, right? And so Jesus warns against this. He's like, don't become like that when the master is delayed. Because when he comes and he finds you unfaithful like that, it's not going to be good, as we'll see uh, this morning. And so the calling for us is to, is to be ready, is to be watching, is to be mindful that our master, he is coming again to claim what's rightfully his. So let's open up to Matthew chapter 24, and we're beginning in verse 32, and we're going all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 51, uh, this morning. So I encourage you to open up there with, with me in your Bibles. We'll have it up on the screen as well. Um, so Jesus, again, he's just been sharing about the signs of the end and of his second coming. And he shared in verses 29 to 31, just before this passage, we're looking at how immediately after the tribulation of those days, he is coming and, and no one will miss it. The whole world will see it. So don't follow people when they say, oh, here's the Christ. He's in the forest. You know, come, he's in this back room. It's like, no, you'll know when he comes again. It won't be a secret. Okay, beginning in verse 32, Jesus continues and he says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. 
So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So we were told that heaven and earth will burn. They, they will burn, they'll, they'll pass away, they'll be made new. But even so, Jesus says his words will not pass away. So pay attention to the weight of his eternal word. His eternal word that never passes away. As he is the word incarnate. <laughs> the one who for him and, and through him and to him are all things. By him, the word of God, creation was spoke into existence. Jesus here uses the fig tree as an analogy for watching for the times, watching for the seasons of things. Uh, so when you see these times coming into fruition, uh, when you see everything he just spoke of earlier, uh, namely the abomination of desolation, as we discussed last week, then he is at the very gates. And the ge generation who sees all these things will see him return. And, and I should mention again this morning, you know, I've said this the past couple weeks, there are many different views on the end times. Very serious Christians uh, and theologians who study the Bible don't, dis, don't, don't agree with me on, on some of this stuff. They will say that when all these things, when you've seen all these things, um, this generation will not pass away. They would say that was fulfilled in 70 AD. And so there are many Christians who believe that. Um, and so I, I don't subscribe to, to that thought, and that's, that's fine. We can agree to disagree on those things. And, and still be brothers and sisters, and we are all still have the same calling to go into all the world, share the good news of Jesus, and we're looking for a second coming. Um, and so just know that there is a lot of different opinions about the end times, and it's not something that, you know, we're going to be at each other's throats about. Uh, but I'm going to share um, kind of how I, my best interpretation of these things. And so I would say that Jesus is speaking of a future generation, a future generation. Uh, that will see all these things, including the abomination of desolation, a final and full fulfillment. There's a fulfillment in 70 AD, for sure, of the destruction of the temple, but, but I believe there's going to be a final and full one. Just as, you know, Mount Whitney is still off in the distance. You know, see the mountains in front of it, but it's still back there, a final and full fulfillment, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, that, that prophetic kind of perspective. Um, okay, so with that said, Jesus uses a fig tree as an analogy here, and the fig tree is a very common tree in Israel. Remember, he just he cursed a fig tree earlier uh, in Matthew, and it, and it died because it didn't have fruit. Um, and now he's using it again as an analogy. It's, it's an oft analogy used in the Old Testament, especially as a description of the abundance of the land, but also as a description of Israel. Like in Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 1 to 10, it, it, it kind of compares Judah to really good figs and really bad figs. It's like there's, there's really good figs here that are delicious and good to eat. There's good fruit here, but then there's really, really nasty fruit that's all shriveled up and dried. And the same thing in Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. It compares Israel, when they were following him, to like the first fruits. Man, the first fruits. Um, and then that first season, the fig puts out fruits, and then, and then they fell away, and they, just, they, they started chasing after uh, false idols and false gods, um, seeking to to make their own gods and become very superstitious. But uh, so there's this comparison between the people of Israel to um, figs. Um, and that's interesting. And because of this, some have speculated uh, that Israel's return to the land marks this final generation. And I, I don't subscribe to this. Uh, but it's interesting, and it's worth sharing and pondering because, because I think mostly of where it comes from, um, this idea from Psalm 90, uh, the only psalm that we see that is attributed to Moses. Uh, he writes how a generation is 70 years, or by reason of strength, 80. And so Israel returned to the land in 1948, and that's a very big prophetic thing that Israel returned to the land, and it's, you know, being restored. Uh, but so 2018 would be 70 years, and then 2028 would be 80 years by reason of strength. Um, and so I guess we'll, we'll see if anything happens uh, between now and 2028. Uh, but anyhow, so Psalm 90, uh, it's a prayer of Moses. And I just want to look at a, a little section of it, verse 10 to 13. So we read, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. You guys experience that? 
they are soon gone, and we fly away. Interesting phrasing there, I think, flying away, heading up to be with the Lord, uh, perhaps even meeting him in the air. Um, Then Moses goes on, he says, verse 11, who considers the power of your anger and, and your wrath according to the fear of you? So again, this life is short, so it's like fear God, consider his power and his anger against sin and wickedness. Uh, so live, you know, knowing that. Uh, and it goes on, verse 12, it says, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. So you see, you know, speaking and thinking of the end, the, the end of our life, the return of Christ, that gains us a heart of wisdom, being ever aware that tomorrow is not guaranteed, that every breath we take is a gift from God. It's a gift from God that we're here this morning. But tomorrow's not guaranteed, so we need, we need to live with that perspective. And, and we, from that, we gain a heart of wisdom to know what's pleasing to God, that how we should live should, should be mindful that he's, that he's the master and he's watching. Um, we want to please him. He's good. Um, And then incredibly, verse 13 of Psalm 90, Moses says this, return, O Lord. How long? Have pity on your servants. So this is Moses, the man of God, who who spoke with God at the tabernacle face to face, and and his face glowed radiant uh, because of his uh, closeness and interaction with the glory of God. What is his desire? It's for the Lord to return. It's for the Lord to return. So his desire, and as is expressed here, it forms this prophetic word of our Lord's second coming, doesn't it? Return, O Lord. And you can just see, it. he might not even know it, but, but he's speaking of the second coming. Return, o, how long? How long? And remember how, how Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus was glorified before his disciples, we studied this earlier in Matthew, and two guys appeared with him, Moses and Elijah, and they're talking together. And what are they talking about? They're talking about his departure, his going to the cross. That's what they're talking about together on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then his ascension into heaven. Okay, but, but there's going to be a return again, isn't there? So Moses here says, return, O Lord, to us. How long? How long must we wait? Have pity on us. Return, O Lord. Isn't Psalm 90 cool? Moses, who so knows God, who so loves God, return, O Lord. Return, Lord Jesus. And the fig tree generation being Israel, I mean, it's an interesting theory. However, we have not seen all these things that Jesus speaks of take place, namely the abomination of of desolation that as we discussed last week, would serve as the true timepiece to the end of the world. Um, And it will trigger world-ending destructions and devastations that if not cut short, Jesus says, nobody would survive. So there will arise catastrophes and persecutions, uh, but those in and of themselves, we, we read, as Jesus said, they're not the sign of the end. The end is a while off. These are the birth pains. Um, And the pivotal sign is that abomination of desolation being set up in the holy place. And when you see that, he warns the people who are in the region to flee. Um, And just as Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, uh, the end will come after 1,290 days, uh, after the abomination of desolation's allotted time. We don't know the exact day or hour, but Daniel 12, 12 says, blessed is he who waits and comes to the uh, 1,335th days. Um, and so there's this time period where we don't know the exact day of his return, but you get some of these examples of three and a half, just over three and a half years um, after the abomination of desolation is set up. Um, so Jesus assures that the agonies of the great tribulation will be short again, otherwise no flesh would survive, um, because on the heels of the abomination of desolation, uh, there come great tribulation and cosmic disturbances. As we read about in Revelation, the bowls of God's wrath are poured out. And in culmination, Jesus will return in glory to the earth. So Jesus here is using the fig tree as this representation of times and seasons uh, to pay attention, to look at all the signs, 
and then you will recognize it just as easily as you would recognize a tree uh, putting forth its leaves. You're like, okay, summer's near because the trees are putting forth their leaves. That's how easy it will be to recognize for the person who's paying attention. It won't be speculative. You'll know. You'll know. There's lots of interesting theories along with that fig tree generation, you know, in Israel uh, that I could share, that I've heard, and it's like, oh, that's interesting, but they all have little gaps. You know, they're not quite right. They're all trying to fit, a, you know, a square peg into, into a round hole. And it's like, okay, you're trying to kind of force this thing. It's, it really doesn't fit. And so that's, we don't want to do that. We don't want to try to force things that don't quite fit. You, you let it be what it's going to be, and you look for the signs. When they happen, you'll know. You'll know he's right at the door, at the very gates. Uh, so the bridegroom is so, so near to claim his bride. And he wants us to know that. So this generation Jesus speaks of, you know, I, I don't, again, I don't think it could be the generation of the 12 that he's speaking to. There's that partial fulfillment, but there's a full one that I believe will be coming. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, so this is, we're still looking for these signs of his coming while we were about his mission to go to the ends of the, of the earth proclaiming the gospel, the good news. Um, and then the end will come. Moving on, uh, verse 36, Jesus continues, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Okay, so, so Jesus like, just so we're clear, no one knows the day or the hour, only the Father. Only the Father. Don't be taken in by these false predictions, these false timetables that people are coming. They're like, I know, I've calculated. I know the day and the hour when he's coming again. Like I told you a few weeks ago, somebody came to the church office and was like, I know, this is it. You guys need to, you know, tell people this. I'm like, uh, what? So, okay. And, you know, that date, of course, passed. It came and it went. Uh, so this, the, we need to watch for all the signs. Verse 37. For as were the days of Noah, Jesus goes on, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. The days of Noah, okay, the days before the destruction of the entire world. What happened? There was only one righteous family left on the earth. You know, Enoch, we know, he was already taken up to be with the Lord. And everyone else on earth was wholly given over to violence and sin. And there was demonic oppression and activity happening. And all flesh was, was corrupted. So God called the animals and the people who were left uncorrupted to what? To spare them from the wrath of God poured out on all flesh. This is a worldwide catastrophe, divine judgment and wrath poured out. Jesus compares the end times to the days of Noah. And this statement of Jesus is another reason that leads me to, to think uh, that there will be a, a pre or mid-tribulation uh, rapture or catching away of the saints to meet Christ in the air, as Paul speaks of, uh, where the true church is delivered from the divine judgment of God on the earth. For in Christ, our sins have been blotted out before the Father. So, yes, will we face persecutions um, on, on this earth? Absolutely. From the powers of this world, we will face tri trials, tribulations, persecutions, and we must endure. That's their calling is to endure these things. And as we discussed, these things are increasing um, around the world uh, in various places, especially sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there is some in intense, intense persecution against Christians. The calling is to endure. We must pray for them as well. Um, but I believe that when the bowls of God's wrath, his divine judgment, are about to be poured out, we will be spared from that. Just as he spared Moses from the flood, uh, his divine judgment on, on the whole earth. As Jesus promised the church in, in Philadelphia, in, in Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 to 11, Jesus says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. With patient endurance, we will be kept from the trial, the hour of the trial uh, that is coming upon who? The whole world. 
And as these trials are unfolding, Jesus explains how in the days of Noah, before the destruction of the world, while, while Noah was, uh, you know, he was proclaiming that what he, by what he was doing and saying that the end is at hand. And people kept living as if nothing would ever change. And in their wickedness, they in fact believed that nothing needed to change. So they just kept on. They kept on eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, meaning no fasting, no prayer, no repentance, no abstention, no getting right before Almighty God, just doing as they pleased, ignoring all the signs, ignoring the prophet of God and mocking him as he built the ark. And then suddenly, judgment came on the whole earth. They will be swept away, as he says. Verse 40, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So be ready. Be ready for his coming. Two men in the field, one is taken, one left. Two women at the mill, one is taken, one left. In the end, there is going to be a dividing that takes place. It doesn't happen you know, in groups or families, coworkers or friends, but it's, it's a dividing on an individual basis. Two are, are together and then one's taken and one's left. On an individual basis. Some commentators assert uh, this, this taking is a taking in judgment and not a reference to the rapture as described in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, others disagree with this, uh, seeing this taken, taking as a, as a definite example of the rapture um, or catching away. Um, it's interesting to note, uh, you know, he, hearing this, you know, Pastor Joe and I were talking about this, like, what is... What is it? I've heard, always thought this was the rapture. What is this? And so I was looking into this uh, this week. You know, is this talking about the taking a judgment or a taking to be with the Lord? Um, and so, you know, we just read about Jesus describing the flood, and those who are unaware are taken away. Um, the ESV translated as swept away. And this Greek word here that Jesus uses um, means forcefully taken. Um, it, it's taken, meaning, meaning cut off or, or swept away in the, in the judgment of the flood. But Jesus, he actually uses a different word uh, to describe what happens when two workers are working in the field or at the mill. Um, and, and this word is, is very much different, and it's interesting. It's uh, paralambla, uh, paralambano, and it, it, it means to take with oneself even like an associate or a companion. It also means to, like, to have received. Uh, it's the same word that he uses. One will be taken, one will be left in the field. Uh, one will be taken, one will be left in the mill. That word taken, it's the same word he uses in John 14, 3, when he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take Palalambano you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. I was like, okay, well, it kind of seems like he's it's a taking to be with him. Um, so, it, and, and again, it could also mean to receive, to receive something transmitted, to receive it in your mind, to receive the gospel, uh, to receive a kingdom. Um, and so to me and, and others, this seems to be a reference to being taken to be with Jesus. Um, one will be received, one will be left. And again, this word for being left is also significant because it's the word that Paul uses um, in 1 Corinthians 7 uh, for a husband putting away his wife. It's the word that uh, Jesus uses when he says to disregard the Pharisees. One is left, one is put away, one is disregarded, let alone give up a thing to let go. In the all but forgotten Geneva Bible, it translates Matthew 24, 41 in this way. It says, then two shall be in the fields, one shall be received, and the other shall be refused. So it's another way to translate it. And it points to, it points to this judgment of God. One will be received, one will be refused. Um, and it could also point to a catching away, right? One will be taken to be with the Lord, 
uh, and one will be left. <clears throat> it's curious how he phrases it. It's like, they're out in the field working, and then boom, you know. Paul, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we, we are caught up to meet him in the air, and then we'll always be with him. And that's cool. And it is comforting. It is. And a seemingly, it's a seemingly unique occurrence that will happen. And then Jesus comes as the conquering king where he's dressed in this robe, dipped in blood with the saints, with his angel armies coming with him you know, as described in, in Zechariah uh, 14, 15. Uh, the saints are with him as well. Um, okay, so these sound like two distinct occurrences to me. I might be wrong, but they do. Um, and, and where there's a trumpet call, we're with him. And then we later on, I don't know how much later on we come down with him. Uh, anyhow, there we are. But whatever your eschatology is, we're, we're all going to be wrong on some things. <laughs> uh, just know that. Uh, but wisdom incarnate tells us we all must be ready for an imminent return of Jesus. We must be ready. Verse 45, he goes on. He says, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he returns when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Okay, so here we kind of get, I think, to the crux of the matter. Uh, the thing Jesus is emphasizing with his disciples uh, is that the king is, is watching, is always watching. And when he returns, the question is, will he find us faithful? Who is the faithful and wise servant? It's the one who who gives the household of God their food at the proper time. And blessed, Jesus says, is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Feeding God's sheep. That's what he commanded Peter to do. If you remember after his resurrection, when they had breakfast together and he restores Peter to himself, he says, feed my sheep three times. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And there is a proper food at the proper time. You know, Paul talks about there's a time for milk, there's a time for meat. There's a proper food for the proper time. And the faithful servant can give the proper food at the proper time if they pay attention. They don't see their master's delay in returning as a time to you know, laze around, but instead as a time to show themselves faithful. How good it is, you know, you parents out there, you mothers in particular, Mother's Day, when you, know, you come home and you find your kids doing what they're supposed to be doing. Isn't that great? You're like, oh, man, I love you. Yeah, it's like, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It is incredible. How much joy, you know, when you return and find them faithful. Exponentially so with Jesus. And so the calling is to stand firm, remain faithful to God alone. There's so much in this world that vies for our attention, that, that desires it, right? It's like demonic spirits leading us into idolatry, that desire our, our, our worship, our love, our adoration. Turn away from them. Turn away. Rebuke the devil and he will flee from you. We belong to Jesus and he loves us so, so much. As a father reprimands his kid for lying and stealing, for doing something dangerous, he, he doesn't do this because he hates the kid, right? He does this because he loves the kid. And in the same way, this same father embraces and lifts up his child and loves him so much. Okay, God loves us even beyond that, even beyond the love of a mother or father of their son, their daughter, beyond that. For he is the one who sent his only begotten son to pay the price for us. It's inconceivable, the love of God, how much he loves us, that Jesus came willingly and went to the cross to take us to himself. He says, follow me, follow me. Don't be drawn in by the ways and the things of this world. Follow me, 
gather to me. That is the heart of God. He is our beloved and we are his. We are so, so special and precious to God. Know that. You perhaps don't know that this morning. And you're here and you feel like you're far from God. Know that he is at the door. He is at the door. And if you would but open and let him in, he is so, so near to you. And perhaps you're here and you've known that and you've found interest in other things. You've gotten distracted. Come back. Come back to him. Get right with God this morning. He is so, so near. And he's waiting and he's watching. So be ready. There are some things in, in, in our lives, perhaps it's stubbornness of heart, perhaps it's lying to ourselves, lying to others. There are things in our life, there's sin in our life that today needs to be uprooted. It needs to be confessed. It needs to be torn up. It needs to be cast aside, lest he come quickly and find that you are still loving your sin more than him. There are things that need to be uprooted in our spirits today. So the promise of Jesus is this in verse 47. If, if we are a faithful servant who has shown ourselves faithful with a little. Faith, he's entrusted us with things. We've shown ourselves faithful with those few things for this short time that we have. It truly is. The short time he's entrusted us with a little bit. If we show ourselves faithful with this time, the stuff he's entrusted us with, he will put us over everything. All of his possessions. And what, it, what are his possessions? It's everything, okay? It, it's, it's everything. It's for him. It's through him. It's to him. And he said, I will give that to you if I return and find you faithful. So he demands much, but he rewards beyond compare, doesn't he? Verse 48. But if the wicked servant says to himself, my, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, a very serious warning from Jesus of, of a wicked servant who thinks he can get away with abusing others, abusing his entrusted authority from the master, fighting, mistreating others around him, carousing, laying around, and the servant will say, when confronted, will say, what's the problem? I'm a good person. Until they're faced with the true master of the house. And then they will see the weight of their arrogance and the filthiness of their sin, and they will be terrified. And why do these servants do this? Why, why does this happen to us? Do we, do we, why do we sense ourselves kind of drifting away at times? Because when the cat's away, the mice will play. Isn't it true? And Jesus is a very big cat. He's the Lion of Judah. As Mr. Beaver says in the Chronicles of Narnia to Susan, asking, you know, about Aslan, the lion, asking, well, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver responds, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. That's our Lord. He isn't safe, but he's good. He rewards the faithful greatly and cuts off the wicked. And that's good news. So as we wrap up, these, these are important matters to consider. And it's worth asking, how would you live differently today, right now, if you knew Jesus was coming tonight? It's like that's, that's the kind of perspective that we're, we're called to have. We're called to live with. And I, and I think, well, you were here, so you're like, yeah, I'd probably do that. I'd probably go to church if I knew Jesus was coming tonight. Uh, and maybe you'd just stay here. It, we'd fast and pray and worship together all day long. Maybe the, it would be a time of confessing and repenting of sins, getting our lives right and our hearts right before God. But then also, maybe there's somebody you need to call. Maybe there's somebody you need to forgive. or ask forgiveness from. Maybe there's something that the Holy Spirit right even now is, is prompting in your heart and your spirit. Saying that's the thing that you've been holding from me. 
I need you to give it to me. I need you to let that go. See, as we consider these things, that the nearness of his return, may we live with that ever in our sight, ever in our sight. The New Testament gives us a very simple solution, I think. Not that it's easy, but it's a simple solution to this. It's to live, to live life faithfully. And it's, it's to live every day in communion with God. It says without ceasing, <laughs> to always be aware of our communion with him, that he is always with us, the spirit is, is in us, it's been given to us. We always have constant communion with God, always being aware of that. And man, how that shapes everything we say, everything we do, how we treat each other, how we seek to live, knowing that he is so, so near, knowing that every day is a gift. Again, tomorrow is not guaranteed. Today is the day of salvation, says our Lord. So we watch, we're aware, we pray without ceasing, knowing he's with us. He's strengthening us, he's correcting us, he's carrying us when needed. Stay, staying a part of the body of Christ, because we help do that for each other as well. Live knowing Jesus is coming. There, there, there's an end point. History is leading to something. There, there's an end point of this world. And that end point is ultimate and final victory of good over evil. All will be made new. There will be reward or judgment for what we have done here and now. And this date, as our Lord said, is only known by the Father. So we live with purpose and with hope. As John, uh, 1 John 3, 2 through 3 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who, has thus hope, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So may, may we thus hope in him, who, who purifies us by his blood, who tells the enemy of our souls to be silent when he accuses us of our guilt and of our shame. Our Lord the Lamb of God declares over you that you are his. You're his. You belong to him. You belong to him. He's purchased you. And he tells the accuser, the enemy of our souls, to be silent. And his mouth is shut. And he cannot utter a word in the presence of the Lamb of God. So may we be found taking refuge in Jesus today, being found a faithful servant, ready to embrace our Lord when he returns. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you have told us the plans that you have, that you have a plan. Lord Jesus, you're preparing a place for us that we may be with you for all time, for you so love us. You so love us. May we be mindful of that. May we abide in you always, being attached to the vine that gives us life, that gives us purpose, that as we're attached to you, Lord Jesus, our true vine, we produce good fruit. The fruits of the Spirit are evident in our life. Lord, may we be a people who produce good fruit, good figs that come from us. And it's a testament to you at work in us. Help us to be ready, watching, mindful of how near you are. At any moment, you can come. Or any moment, we may go to be with you. Thank you for the hope that we have. That in that hope, to live as Christ, to die as gain that we hope and we long to be with you, but as you tarry, we live for you. Thank you for helping us do that. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you can stay seated. You all started standing up at the right. <laughs>